Life would be so easy if we had the same data, the same questions, and the same goals, right? <laughs> Fortunately, we don't all have the same data, the same questions, and the same goals. But because we're all trying to do different things, when we try to build statistical models, and especially machine learning models, we need to adjust parameters to customize the model to the data and to the questions. We'll talk about how we can adjust those parameters, which we'll call hyperparameters, in today's episode. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss and this is Code Club. In the last episode, we talked about pre-processing our data as a way of kind of cleaning up the data set, rescaling and recentering all the data to make it run uh, more quickly and to get a more robust analysis. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about another set of adjustments that we need to make to what are called the hyperparameters. The hyperparameters are the parameters that go into the model that affect how the model is trained and fit on the data. One of the things that we have to appreciate is that we could add more and more and more parameters to the point where the model fits our data really well. But when the model now sees new data, it's gonna perform horribly because the model was overtrained to the data. The model that we've been using to kind of motivate our progress through learning about machine learning in the Microbe ML package has been a logistic regression model. One of the parameters that we can use in logistic regression is regularization. So we've been using L2 um, logistic regression. And with that model comes a hyperparameter called lambda, which affects the, the um, regularization process. It affects how many features effectively from the full set make it into the final model. It kind of adjusts the weighting, if you will. That all goes into, again, getting a more reliable fitting of the data. Microbe ML comes with some preset lambda values that it automatically tries to fit to the data and then outputs a variety of area under the curve values for each of those uh, lambda values. So what we're gonna do today is see how well uh, the default lambda values fit our data. We're gonna see how we can adjust uh, those lambda values because they don't fit the data very well. And then we'll talk about how we can visualize the data to get a better sense of, you know, where is the optimal lambda value for our data. So to get going with that, we'll go ahead and head over to our studio. Here we are in our genusml.r script. Uh, you'll recall that this reads in the data at the genus level, relative abundance data. Uh, the data set that I'm working with was previously published by my lab uh, from a former graduate student named, named Neil Baxter, who was looking at variation in the gut microbiota by colon cancer status. And so what we're doing is we're trying to predict whether or not somebody has a screen relevant neoplasia or an SRN uh, based on the structure of their gut microbiota. And so we go ahead and read in all that genus data and get it tidy and all, all looking good. <laughs> um, we load our microbe ML package, we get everything uh, formatted correctly, and then we can pre-process the data as we discussed in the last episode. The default pre-processing that I'm doing will um, remove any columns where there's no variation in the data or very low variation in the data. It will also uh, center and scale all of our relative abundance data so that the mean is zero and one represents one standard deviation above the mean and minus one equals uh, one standard deviation below the mean, right? And then we have our run ML call, which goes ahead and as we see, where you're doing method GLM net, it goes ahead and does that logistic regression. Let's go ahead and run this. As we've seen in the past, it takes about 90 seconds to run. So as we look at the output from run ML for uh, our set of parameters, if you come to the top, there's a um, object in SRN genus results called trained model that has all sorts of information more than actually is being shown to the screen here. And what you'll see is there's a table here where the first column is Lambda. And then we've got a bunch of different columns that you can use to assess uh, you know, which lambda value is the best. The one that we're gonna look at is this AUC column, which is again, the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve or AU rock curve. Um, and so what we'll see then is that right at about one or maybe 10, uh, we have a peak AUC value. So some, a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, uh, this is for one split of the data, right? And so we could have done another 80-20 split. Again, we take that 80% of the data and you fit parameters and you kind of do your five-fold cross-validation before you test it on that held out 20%. That 80% is where we're calculating these lambda values. So if we'd have done another 80-20 split, we'll get different AUC values, right? And so what we'll want to think about is 
perhaps doing this a bunch of times so that he can get a better handle on uh, our AUC values and what the optimal lambda value is. The other thing is that we see that the tuning parameter alpha was held constant at a value of zero. So GLMnet actually has two hyperparameters we can set, alpha and lambda. Uh, the lambda, as I mentioned, affects the regularization and how the weightings are performed for doing the, the fitting of the data. So with an alpha of zero, that indicates that we did L2 regularization of the data. This is also called ridge regression. If we used a value of one, that would have been L1 regression. Um, regularization of regression, and that is also called lasso regression. So I'd encourage you to go, go read more about regression and machine learning algorithms to get a better sense of what's going on there. Um, we could also set alpha to be a value between zero and one, and that's called an elastic net. What we're looking at is L2 regularization of the data when we set alpha to be zero, and we've got these built-in lambda values that we'd like to perhaps think about how can we change those values. So we can give run ML our own hyperparameters by giving it the hyperparameter uh, hyperparameters argument. And then we need to give that a list indicating the values of the hyperparameters that we want it to evaluate. And so I'm gonna go ahead in here and I'll put test HP. And so I need to define test HP and that actually needs to be a list, right? And so we'll do test HP equals list. And so a list is a data type in R that can kind of, you think I think of it as kind of accumulating or pulling together different types of data. And so I can put in alpha equals zero. And so again, that is for our L2 regularization. And then I can do lambda and I can give that a vector of values. So I could do like 0 0.1, 1, 3, 5, 10, um, something to realize is that for each combination of alpha and lambda, we're going to do 100 cross-fold validations. So I could put in 10 lambdas, um, but that's going to double effectively the time it takes to fit all those parameters, right? So let's st start with these values of lambda. Um, it's a bit broader of a range. Um, actually, it's a bit, it's adjusted, right? Uh, instead of going from 10 to the minus four up to 10, we're looking at 0.1 to 10 with some kind of more granular steps in between. So we'll go ahead and load test HP, and then we'll go ahead and run our model and see what the output looks like. All right, if we do SRN genus results, we again get the same similar type of output, but again, what we're looking for is this data frame, um, again, where we've got these five lambda values we set, and we see that the AUC does seem to kind of go up from 0.1 to 1 to 3, and then it kind of falls off. But man, that's really like, that's out in like the 10,000th place of the decimal point. So it, I suspect it comes up and then is kind of flat. So I think we've got a pretty good range here from 0.1 uh, to 10. We are doing one split, right? And so maybe what we'd actually like to do is let's think about doing, uh, let's do like three splits, right? Uh, again, just to get a sense of what's going on. In this episode, I don't wanna do a deep dive on how we do tons <laughs> of splits um, and different ways we can make that more efficient, but I wanna kind of give you a sense of how we can begin to think about what lambda value is the best for multiple splits. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn my run ML in all its arguments into its own function, and I'll call this get SRN genus results, and I'll say function, and I will uh, give this an argument. I'm actually going to give it an argument that we'll call seed uh, because we will give a different seed to run ML um, every time we run this. So we'll say seed equals seed down here in run ML. Uh, that looks good. And so again, if I do uh, get SRN genus results and then I give one as my seed, it will use one as the seed for my random number generator. Again, this takes uh, a minute and a half or so to run. Just wanna double check that everything looks good. So that looks good. I'll go ahead now and write my map function. So I'll do map uh, C123. And so that's gonna be the three seeds that I'm going to send to get SRN results, uh, SRN genus results. This will run get SRN genus results three times. The first time with a seed of one, the second time with a seed of two, and the third time with a seed of three. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call this um, iterative uh, run ML um, results. <laughs> uh, 
And so this will output a data frame or an object that has the results from running run ml three times. So that ran through. Uh, something I just want to briefly comment on is that we're still getting this warning message about things not converging or working well. Um, we're not totally sure what this means. The models seem to perform pretty well in spite of this warning message. So I'm going to kind of ignore it for now. Um, and maybe in future releases of MicropML, uh, we'll get a little bit more information about what's going on here outputted to, to you all, the users. All right, so if we look at iterative run ML results, we see that we have a list, it's a list of three different elements for each of the three different runs of the model, okay? And so what I'm interested in is this trained model section uh, for each of the values in the list. I can extract that by doing iterative uh, run ML results and piping that to the map function where I use the pluck function. So pluck is from per, and that will then, I can pull out the trained uh, model uh, element from each element of the list. And so pluck will basically pluck out trained model from each seat, if you will, in the list. And so if we look at this now, we see that we've got the third, uh, trained results, the second, and the first. We can then pipe this output to combine HP performance as a function. And let me go ahead and put these on uh, different lines. And what we'll get out is a data frame, dot, uh, dollar sign dat, uh, that has our alpha value as well as our lambda values and the AUCs. So I'm going to call this uh, performance. MicropML has some helper functions built in to do things like helping you to visualize uh, the performance of your models across different hyperparameters. And so we'll do plot uh, HP performance, and then we'll give it performance. And what we want is the, uh, that dat uh, data frame in uh, performance, because uh, that's a list. And so a dollar sign dat gets you that data frame out of the list. And then we need to give it um, the hyperparameter that we want to plot on our x-axis, and so we'll put lambda. And then we want uh, the metric that we want to put on the y-axis, and so that's going to be AUC. So what we get out is, as I described, we get our lambda on the x-axis and the mean AUC on the y-axis. Uh, the range of our mean AUC values is pretty small, especially compared to the standard deviation. So the error bars here represent plus or minus one standard deviation in the data. Again, we're doing three... Um, iterations. So it's it's probably not that reliable to read too much into this. We'd like to perhaps do a hundred of those splits to get a better sense of the variation. But you can kind of get the sense that it, it does kind of peak around three and then fall off on either side. I might want to come back and do um, one, two, three, four, five, ten, <laughs> right, to get a better sense of that variation of the data. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, what we can do is we can come back up and do one, two, uh, three, four, five, ten. This will give us kind of more, um, more of a grid or more granularity to our lambda hyperparameter. So we see from the plot that's outputted that we do have better uh, coverage, if you will, between 0 0.1 and 5 now. Um, it's not totally clear uh, which is the peak value. So like we've seen in the past, we can, of course, take a look at performance dollar sign dat and kind of work with that on its own, right? And so this now is a data frame, right? We can do all of the great group by and summarize things that we've done in the past to get a sense of, you know, what is the optimal um, alpha, lambda. We can get the mean AUC. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's get the mean AUC. And we could do group by, and we'll do group by alpha and lambda, right? And then we can do a summarize. Hopefully this feels a little bit more comfortable to those of you that aren't so sure about this machine learning stuff yet. Uh, we can do mean AUC equals mean on AUC. And so now we get our mean AUC values. I can go ahead and do uh, dot groups equals drop. And we can then pipe this to a top N. And we're going to say N equals 1. And we'll then give it mean AUC to then get out the top AUC. And we see that the top AUC 
is 0.631 with a lambda of three. Uh, again, we set alpha as zero, so there's no change there, okay? So this is great. We have a variety of ways of looking at the optimal uh, lambda, you know, whatever the hyperparameter is, and getting back the mean AUC. Not that we would necessarily want to do this, but let's, let's, let's see what happens if we modify alpha so that we perhaps looked at like say, let's do zero, uh, 0.5 and one, right? So we'll do zero, 0 0.5 and one. And this is taking a little bit longer to run than I'd really like it to. Um, so let me go ahead and um, let me change my CV times from 100 to 10. I just want to do a demo here to see what the output would look like if we were tuning two hyperparameters. So plot HP performance. Um, at this point, we'll only plot one hyperparameter, uh, lambda, across the x-axis here. Um, I guess I could do plot HP performance with alpha. And what you'll see is that we get kind of a drop in alpha as we go from 0 to 0.5 to 1. But of course, there's two values there, right? And so it's not totally a head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, if we look at performance dollar sign dat a little bit closer, we again see now that we've got, um, we ran this three times, and each of the three times we got an alpha of 0, 0.5, and 1, as well as those hyperparameters of 0 0.1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 10, along with the outputted AUC values. Uh, for whatever reason, for a lot of these uh, 0.5 alphas, we get an AUC of 0.5, which is effectively random. Anyway, um, so let's look at the top n uh, with three and see what we get for the, the three conditions that gave us the highest mean AUCs. Not much of a surprise um, that the alpha is zero and then our three lambdas of right around two, three, and four gave us the highest uh, mean AUCs. Um, we saw some problems with plotting the performance. Let's, let's take another look at that though, right? So let's go ahead and instead of looking at the top n, um, I'll comment that out for now, but let's do ggplot and we'll do AES and across the X axis, cause that's the variable I'm most interested. Let's put Lambda. And then for our Y, let's put the mean AUC. And then for the color, uh, let's put the alpha um, and we'll do geom line. Now, one of the problems with this is that alpha is a numerical value. And so it's gonna treat color as a continuous variable, of course, and it's gonna look really funky. Uh, so let's go ahead and do as dot character on alpha. And so that'll basically treat each alpha, so 0, 0 0.5 and 1, as three discrete values. And so now we can see that we do have 0 as having the highest mean AUC, 0.5 um, is highest at about 0.1, as is um, the L, L1 regression with the alpha of 1. Now, it's a little bit deceiving because our largest lambda value is 0.1. And if we went to smaller lambda values, we might actually um, need a much smaller lambda value for the 0.5 and 1. And the AUC might be better than what we see at 3 for an alpha of 0, right? So again, these are the things that you can mess with, <laughs> or tune, I guess better word than mess with, so things, the parameters that you can tune um, to get the best area under the curve, right? And so um, I'm focusing on the um, the L2 uh, regularization uh, through these series of episodes to kind of get our feet under us, so to speak, and try to learn how Microbe ML works before branching out and looking at uh, different modeling approaches. Something you might be wondering about is how do you know what the different hyperparameter options are and what are the default values for the various different modeling approaches? Well, we have a helper function for that. And so you can do get underscore hyperparams list and then you can give it the name of the data frame that you're running through the model. And so again, ours was SRN genus preprocess. And then you can put after that the name of the modeling approach. So we could do GLM net uh, to see we, the lambda values and the alpha values. Uh, we could also do RF, which is for random forest, which we'll, we'll see soon enough, don't worry. Um, and so there are three M tri values, uh, M tri being the only hyperparameter. Uh, that our version of random forest will use. Another of that you might think about would be SVM radial. Get those variety of hyperparameters. Some of the hyperparameters do depend on the data. So for example, uh, the number of M tries, M tri values depends on how many features you have. 
whereas what we saw for like lambda it doesn't really care um it these are kind of baked in hyperparameters for a decision tree uh, we would use r part two to see that there's one hyperparameter of max depth again this is also dependent on the number of features that you have and then finally we can put in xg boost which is x G B tree. And here, this XGB boost has the most uh, different hyperparameters that are available um, for tuning, uh, building those XG boosted trees. It's, an, it's a, a variation on random forest. So let's go ahead and clean up our code a little bit to get it ready for the next episode, uh, because something we'd like to do is perhaps go ahead and uh, do 100 splits so we can get the most robust fit of the hyperparameters of that lambda value. Um, I'm going to turn this alpha back down to zero. Uh, these all look pretty good. And I think we're in good shape. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And I will commit it after I finish saying goodbye to you all. Um, but again, I hope this kind of drives home the point, if that wasn't already clear, that machine learning algorithms are not simply plug and play. You can't just kind of plug in your data let it chug and get out meaningful results. That might happen, right? That, that Sometimes that does happen. But uh, more often than not, some tuning needs to be done, some careful thought in picking hyperparameters, picking your modeling approach, um, how, figuring out how you know uh, you have a robust model. And that's what we're kind of slowly working through here in these episodes. So I encourage you to be patient. Uh, we are obviously learning a lot about MicropML, but as we also saw today, showed you the pluck uh, function combined with map that allows us to get uh, specific elements out of each value in a list. We'll see more things in the next episode as we scale up what we've done here to doing um, 100 splits uh, and seeing how we can use the map function with and without parallelization to go ahead and run that. And we're slowly again uh, getting up through a bunch of other really advanced topics that are, I say advanced, but they're really necessary, right? So thinking about how do you know if one model is better than another? How do you uh, evaluate a model? How do you uh, figure out what features are most important in a model? Well, that's all coming in future episodes of Code Club. So uh, thanks for making it this far. Encourage you to be patient and stick with us. I've got a lot of great stuff coming along. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.